Have you heard the exciting news? On January 25th, 2023, Tammy Zonker is hosting her first annual and free virtual summit for you and 999 other fundraisers and nonprofit leaders. Transform 23, also known as Fundraising Transformation Virtual Summit, is hyper-focused on equipping fundraisers everywhere to take your fundraising to the next, next level. We've put together 10 wow-packed sessions with you in mind, led by 10 incredible four thinking experts to help you transform your fundraising in 2023 and beyond. And a special shout out to our transformation sponsor, The Giving Block. Now here's the thing, while it's free for you to attend, spots are limited. So go to fundraisingtransform.com transform23 and save your spot now. If you're looking for proven ways to take your fundraising results to the next level, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Intentional Fundraiser Podcast, hosted by Tammy Zonker. Tammy has trained and led thousands of nonprofit organizations to collectively raise more than a half billion dollars, and is also recognized as one of America's top 20 fundraising experts. This is the podcast where Tammy equips and empowers amazing fundraising pros like you to transform your fundraising so you can transform the world. And now, let's hear from Tammy. It's no secret that we're big fans of Bloomerang around here. They're a leading provider of donor management software that helps nonprofits deliver a better giving experience so they can raise more money and create lasting change. Today on the Intentional Fundraiser Podcast, I'm talking with James Golner. James is a partnership manager with Bloomerang with almost 20 years of experience working in nonprofit technology sales and relationship management. James brings the perfect blend of experience to his role as a partnership manager at Bloomerang. In his seven years there, he's enjoyed helping nonprofits and those who work with them find success with Bloomerang increasing their effectiveness, and ultimately achieving their missions. In addition to his work, James volunteers with Project Grows, a community farm in Virginia. Their mission is to improve the health of children and youth through garden-based education and access to healthy food across a three-county region. They know that kids who have a hand in growing their own vegetables also love to eat them. And unfortunately, fresh, healthy food isn't always accessible for a lot of children, youth, and families. And that's why, James, I just think it's the coolest mission, and I love that you're involved with them. James serves on the board with Project Grows and participates in volunteer nights with the organization. In his free time, James enjoys hiking in the beautiful Shenandoah Valley with his wife and four children and exploring local wineries and breweries. He loves to cook, read, and travel. James, I think we were twins from different mothers. <laughs> Welcome to the show. We're going to get along great. <laughs> we're going to get along great is right. Support for this show is brought to you by Bloomerang. Our friends at Bloomerang really understand fundraisers, which is why they make donor management and online fundraising software that nonprofits love to use. To learn more and to join them in their vision of building a world inspired by giving, head over to bloomerang.com forward slash intentional dash fundraiser. A few weeks ago, we were both speaking at the nonprofit storytelling conference, and your session was about how to use stories to drive donor retention and authentic relationships. And it was so good. I mean, I heard people raving about it in between sessions. I heard people talking about it in the elevator. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind. <laughs> well, I thought it would be helpful to bring your insights to our Intentional Fundraiser podcast audience. I'm so happy to be here. That was a wonderful conference. It was a wonderful opportunity to get to talk about retention through the lens of storytelling and how we can improve re outcomes by engaging empathy and, and really engaging our audiences a little bit better. So I'm glad to, glad to talk with you all too. That's awesome. So first, talk to us a little bit about the state of donor retention. Sure. I'd like to say that it's going great, but 
but it seems to kind of flatlined. As long as I've been with Bloomerang, so almost eight years now, we've hovered somewhere between 40 and 45% or so for overall donor retention. Not, probably not the outcomes that most people, that means of course, that for every, let's say 10 donors that they get, four, four and a half of them are not coming back. And when you break it down, we like to look at different buckets within that overall number. And when you break it down a little bit and look at first time donors, and that's where the, the news gets even worse. There's good news. So stay tuned. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But the first time donor retention rate is really staying pretty steady around the 18 to 20% range. And it has been for years and years at this point. What that tells me is that we as an industry are spending an awful lot of time and money and effort to pull these new donors in. A lot of times that's through events, right? And then they're presumed a great time at the event. They're learning about the organization. They're getting excited. They're saying, oh, this is such a great mission. I can't wait to support it. And then they do support it. And then they don't come back the next year, or at least four out of five of them, don't, which again, isn't, isn't great. The last bucket that we look at then are the repeat donors. That number is the silver lining. I think that's a little bit higher than 60% and it has been for a while. And that tells me that what we need to do is focus on the first time donors. So if we get them to repeat and we get them to come back, not that we can let them alone and, and just pretend that they're not there or anything, we still need to steward them and nurture that relationship. But if you can get them over the hump to getting that second gift, we're going to be in a lot better shape as far as your attention goes. So that's, those are the buckets that we look at. There's some other sub buckets as well that I'm, I'm sure we'll discuss as we go through, but those are the ones. And really, I think that's kind of the game plan that we need to think about moving forward is how do we impact those first time donors and time donors? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for them, they're all excited Like they came to the event. They were inspired, as you said. And for us, sometimes after the event, we think, shoo, that's over. I get to take a break. I'm going to take a few days off. But the truth is, for the donor, it's just beginning. Mm. And, and what we do in those days and weeks that follow can make or break that retention. That's exactly right. Yep. And if you can take the opportunity to get to know them a little bit, that can inform how you communicate with them moving forward. If, if one of the things that, that we constantly tell both our current users and our potential users at Bloomerang is to pick up the phone. Retention rates increase substantially. The size of the second gift increases substantially. How quickly that second gift comes increases substantially if you pick up the phone and call people. So that also gives you the opportunity to them a little bit and they kind of figure out how they want to be communicated with and what they're really interested in. Why did they donate something and at the event? And they said, okay, all right, I was thinking about donating, but that put me over the edge. Because if you can find out what that is, then you have a lot of information about what drives that person and you can really tailor your communication to them moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, so true. So let's just talk about why do so many donors stop giving? Mm. So the Lilly School of Philanthropy did a study a while back and they did a big survey to a whole bunch of donors asking essentially that, why did you lapse? What's up? And the responses they got back, there were a couple of different categories, right? Unfortunately, fact of life is some people will pass away. Some people will move. Whoa. Those are things we can't really control. So don't worry too much about that, that bucket. But the second bucket, really, there were four or five different responses that all could be boiled down to, in my opinion, lack of communication. So the responses that they gave were things like, I didn't know how my money was being used, or I didn't feel like I was part of a mission, or I didn't know that the charity needed me, or some of them just said poor communication. I would have liked to have gotten a newsletter or something like that. I think. Sometimes we look and we say, okay, they gave, yay. But as you just said, Tammy, that's the beginning. That's not the end. That's the first step, hopefully, in a relationship that span years. And they want to know all about the organization. They've already said, yeah, we like what you're doing. We want to support you. So give them the information and, and tell them about the programs that are going on. Invite them in for a tour. See if they want to volunteer. Tell them, tell them what you're doing, how you're using the, the money. With you and, and make sure that you take the time to get to know them and to really communicate with them in the way that they want to be communicated with. And I, I think that's what the, the results of that survey really is that people want to, they want to know more and they want to find out what you're doing and how they can help further. 
so good. Now, I also understand there's new research about retention of subscription-based donors coming out of the Indiana University School of Philanthropy. Tell us a little bit about that. And by subscription, I'm assuming that means monthly giving programs or ongoing. Uh, right. Yes. So tell us. Yeah, recurring donations. Most of them are monthly, but some people do weekly, others yearly, and, and everything in between. But, but most of the time it's monthly. Exactly right. And yeah, the Indiana school found that, first of all, the retention rates are incredibly high for our donors. For, for most people, it's kind of a set it and forget it thing. Whether it's 10 bucks a month, 20, 100, whatever it is, you just don't think about it that much. You might see it on your credit card statement or your bank statement or however you have it set up. But outside of that, you're just not that much. The other interesting thing that this study found out was how these people want to be communicated with. When I speak at conferences and, and other venues, one of the most common questions that I get is, how often should we thank our monthly givers? Do they want to hear from us every gift they give once a year? Whoa, what do they want? And my immediate answer always is, have you asked? Pick up the phone, ask them because they're all different. And some of the okay, I just want one thank you letter at the end of the year. I'm good. Others are going to say, sure, I'd love a text message once a month like that. And, and others will say, ah, one thank you letter is fine, but I really do want to hear about your programs. I want to hear about events that you have coming up, your volunteer opportunities, all of that kind of stuff. And so the more that you can share with these people about the different things that are going on and the different things that you're offering, the better off you're going to be if they want to hear that from you. That was the overwhelming feedback that uh, the folks got from the study is that recurring donors by and large do want to hear but there are some that don't. So you have to be careful. Take the time to, to talk to those people. Thank them profusely for their $25 a month or whatever it is. And then ask them, what do they want to hear? And how often do they want to hear it from you? And they'll tell you. Yeah. And it seems to me, having worked inside a nonprofit organization, that then we should set up tracks for these communication sequences, right? Yep. Because you just cannot manage all of that manually. So the automation based on the donor's preferences really becomes key in making this sustainable. Exactly. Wow. Yep. And and as you said, I work for Bloomerang. So that is that is something we continue to work on and continue to to try to make better and better because that is the way that the world is going. You want to have as much personal information about these people as you can. You want to employ the personal touch as often as you can while still, like you said, Tammy, kind of those cadences and those sequences so that you as the fundraiser are not having to sit down every single day and say, okay, I need to send this email to this person and this phone call to this person and all of that. You want to try to automate some of that stuff while still being able to employ your personal touch when you can. You're exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So how else can we improve retention and what role does storytelling play in the process? Well, I think storytelling is really what it boils down to. I had a woman come up to me and I won't name and shame or anything like that. She said, I really want to tell stories in our annual report and our newsletter and our phone calls that we have. I, I want to tell the stories because I think we're impactful work. And I think people want to hear about that. But my board is really fixated on the numbers, right? So they want to talk about the number of new programs we've launched and the number of families that we've served and all of that. And I think we should do some of that, but I really want to tell those stories. And she said, but I'm, they're pushing back really hard on this. And I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Is it better to, to kind of lead with the statistics that I need to, as best you can, I realize you're in a difficult position, but put back on that because you will have people who want those statistics, right? That's perfectly appropriate. And we should be sharing those. We do have those people who are very analytical and who want to know, okay, I gave X amount and that served this many families. And that's all fantastic. But you're also going to have Frankly, it's going to be the majority of people, I think. A lot of people who want stories more than they want those statistics. I'll tell a, a quick story, if you'll humor me. It's very personal. It's about my family. About 10 years ago, our youngest daughter went to Project Rose, the, the farm that she met. 
We went on a field trip, third, fourth grade, something along those lines. And she went on a field trip. They have marvelous kids programs, right? They take the students out to the farm. They give them seeds. They show them how to plant the seeds the right way, how to water them, all of that. And Sunny actually ended up back a few times over that summer and watching her look at her plant because that radish plant was her plant. She planted it, she watered it, she weeded around it, she nurtured that thing as often as she could, as often as we would get her out to the farm. Was, uh, watching that process was absolutely amazing. And then what happened, we were at the time not eating as healthily as we probably should have. And so the radish eventually was harvested and she had never tasted a radish before and she obviously and, and all of that. And then she, she bit into it and she said, I really like this. It's a little bit spicy, but there's a little bit of sweetness there. She had this very defined palate for a third grader, I will say. And, and she loved radishes, still eats them today, but it inspired legitimately. It really inspired my wife and I to start eating a lot more healthily to incorporate those fruits and vegetables and local food and all of that into our diets. And the end result is I'm older than I was then. And I, my doctor is very, very happy. Having gone to a physical just a couple of months ago and seen my blood pressure results, he's very pleased with how this has gone. So those are the kinds of stories I think that can really make an impact as opposed to just saying, oh yeah, we had 13 field trips come out to the farm last month. And those 13 field trips comprised 150 kids and they did this, 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 and this. And then my daughter turns into essentially, whereas if you talk through that story and get permission, obviously we've given permission more times than I can count to tell that story. But if you get permission and tell that story, that's more impactful for a lot of people than just those statistics and the numbers and all of that sort of thing. So I think that's where when on an ongoing basis, a donor can hear that kind of story and say, oh, wow. Okay. Well, I, my money is, is really helping out that I live in. Yeah. I want to keep supporting you. Yeah. I love that story. Thank you for sharing it. I think that it boils down to the fact that stories should really connect and be relatable, mm -hmm. right? Clear, simple, human. And even for those donors who are analytical, who like numbers, I've always heard and, and lived as someone who has managed portfolios of major donors and engaged with donors at all giving levels, that people are basically emotional donors, and some look for rational reasons to justify their emotional decision to give. Yep. And I do believe that's the crossroads of statistics and the numbers. Yep. And those authentic stories. That is such a great point. I, I think that my wife tends to fall into that category of looking at the numbers and being very analytical. But when we go to the the Boys and Girls Club events here in town or whatever, and she hears those stories, it reinforces in her that, oh yeah, we're making the right decision. We need to keep supporting this organization because they're doing fantastic work. I think you're a hundred percent right that the more you can okay, really draw on empathy and your stories and get the donors to put themselves in the shoes that you're telling a story about, I, the outcomes will be fantastic. I think you're exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is evoking that empathy and that authentic emotion that connects people. Absolutely. Sure. And let's face it, when our donors, our supporters are out in the community talking about our organizations, they probably don't even remember all of the statistics and the numbers. Right. But boy, do they remember those stories. Yes. Just yep. like the Heat Brothers taught us, in, in, the stories are sticky. Absolutely. Yeah. They may not remember the names. They may not remember exactly what vegetable it was or whatever, but they will remember, oh, that's right. I heard about that, that little girl who wanted to get her hands in the dirt and nurture this and all that. Those are the things that stick with them. You're a hundred percent right. Yeah. It's, it's authentic and just heart centered. And it's the reason people give. It's the reason we work in this sector and, uh, and mission focused, yes. purpose driven. Absolutely. Yeah. Talk to us about the importance of segmenting our communication and employing that personal touch. Sure. I think the goal with this should be, again, to, I feel like I'm, I'm beating this drum a lot, but I, I think there's a lot of truth to it, I, to get to know your donors. Find out what's important to them. So 
ideally, you would get to find out which programs, which audiences, what results, all of that, what's important to which donors so that you can then say, okay, we're build a, a new library for our facility here. And I know that literacy is important to Emily, my wife. So we're going to talk to the Golders about helping that specific project instead of just a broad, hey, we've got a capital campaign coming up and we need your help. If you can really drill down and narrow your focus to find people who are deeply passionate about the very specific things that you're working on and the outcomes that you're trying to improve in your community, you'll find a lot more than just a generic, please help us. We we have a capital campaign going on or, or whatever it is. So ideally, it would be great to use your database to drill down into those different segments and really personalize that content. And it could be an email. It could be however you're choosing to interact with these people, the more knowledge you have about what is important to them and what they're passionate about, the better those outcomes for you are going to be, I think. I know that it's not always realistic to get that kind of information, right? Sometimes donors want to be anonymous. Sometimes they won't answer the phone. So I, I understand all that. That's the best case scenario. The other, the kind of the big segmentation, my, I guess my go-to that anyone can do is to look at brand new donor versus repeat donor, and then look at above the average gift versus below the average gift. So if you get a brand new donor that is above your average donation amount, jingle bells should, should go off because that's, that's a really good sign that this person is passionate, that they've already decided that you're really important to them and that they are, they are really testing the waters. They want to, they want to find out what's going on, what happens next, what kind of information do they get? All of those things that we talked about earlier, don't anybody, but pay special attention to that quadrant. If they're above the getting a first time donor, that's, that's really important. But the more that you can segment, the better, the better that you'll be. And if you don't have the capability, now you can get there, just make it a, a habit right away to call your donors after that gift and find out as much information as you can and track that information. And then that'll start to accumulate and you'll be able to, to segment more effectively then. Yeah. Beautiful. One of my go-to segments is always donor loyalty. Those yeah. who've been giving for a long duration of time. Yep. I mean, they are more likely to answer that call or return your voicemail What's or happening? respond and set up a time via meeting request that you sent via email. I think that's also a really important segment to pay attention to. Even if the gift values have been somewhat modest, there could be capacity there and certainly there's legacy giving opportunities there. Our friends at Bloomerang know the importance of year-end fundraising to a nonprofit's longevity and success throughout the year. We know that 50% of nonprofits receive a majority of their annual contributions from October to December. To learn how you can make the most of this giving season, head over to bloomerang.com forward slash intentional dash fundraiser to get your copy of the 13 year-end fundraising tips. James, what are your other go-to donor segments you think are important to pay attention to? I think if you have if you have an organization that has volunteers, take a look at the volunteers who have donated and the volunteers who haven't donated. And then be careful how you approach. But if they care enough to volunteer and they haven't donated, I think it's worth having a conversation with them. And those who are both volunteering and donating, as you just said, Tammy, not, it doesn't have to be big gifts. Uh, I be, but it doesn't have to be. They're doing those things. They're spending both time and money with you. That's a huge flashing sign that these people are deeply committed to what you all are doing and they really want to help out wherever. So it could be that you talk to them about who else they know in the community that maybe would like to volunteer, donate, something along those lines. You might talk with them about planning. And I know sometimes people say, oh, well, wait a minute, don't you have to be rich to plan game. No, you, you can, if you've got someone who is volunteering and donating, you are hugely important to them and they would be delighted to have a conversation 
with you about some sort of a plan to get that indicator of super high engagement and connectedness. Yeah, I, I would definitely take those for sure. Yeah. I was just reading an article yesterday about things to plan for in 2023. And this observation was built on the Giving USA, the most recent Giving USA data. And it talked about the, the fact that we have a generosity crisis, mm. that there are fewer donors giving overall. Right. The donors at those higher gift values, like those, they're giving higher gift values at the top. And there continue to be people giving generous, yep. big part of people giving at those smaller gift values, but that middle donor is shrinking. Yep. And as I read that, and as I listen to you talking about, call your donor, understand what programs, which stories will appeal to them. It seems to me that that middle donor space is definitely an area to focus on when it comes to retention and connecting with their story, their passion. What are your thoughts about that? I couldn't agree more. I think this, I think you can take this part of the conversation back to the recurring or monthly giving platform as well. There are a lot of people out there who cannot afford to write a $5,000 check today, but if you broke it to $500 a month or something like that, yeah, they could probably do that. So if you think about taking that recurring monthly model, and applying it to people in the middle. The same thing is true with maybe they can't write a thousand dollar check, but a hundred bucks a month. Sure. So you have to kind of figure out, and, and there are so many tools out there to help with this, with wealth screening and all of that to help you figure out where the people can be slotted. But if you can work with them and, and start talking through those options with them, you'll find that your middle range donors that you're talking about, Tammy, you, you can, you can move some of them from the the smaller donors to that middle pot through recurring giving, which is not really something that they're thinking about. They're thinking, I mean, maybe I could afford to write a $2,000 check, but it would really be kind of tight. And But then you say, $200 a month, could you? And they'll say, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. So it's, it's kind of a reframing of how they're thinking about things that can be incredibly successful. So yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. At that middle range group of donors, something that that I, I think a lot of people are are concerned about as well, because as you said, the, we've got this big group of major donors and they're giving so generous, so faithfully, but we're not seeing the replenishment and the pipeline to use sales vernacular that we need in order to replace those when life eventually happens one way or another. The more that we can do to move to it start positioning some people from the lower levels on up into the, the mid levels is absolutely the, the right approach, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So James, working at Bloomerang with so many nonprofit clients, I'm sure you have a few success stories to inspire us, to segment our data, to share more stories, to personalize our communication with donors. Could, could you share a couple stories? Yeah, sure. We've got one of my my very favorite groups that we work with is a childhood cancer foundation in Richmond, Virginia, about an hour and a half away from me. And they do a peer-to-peer -peer 5K every year. And my wife and I ran several, well, gosh, this is a while ago now, six or seven years ago, something like that. Emily had a coworker whose child unfortunately did have cancer and everything's fine now. Everything's good. It, it was not not great for a while there and Ask provided them with a lot of resources and a lot of help. And and this coworker knew that Emily really likes to run and knew that I would jump that. So I I went, so we both went and ran and Britt Nelson, development director there, did such a nice job following up with us afterwards and staying in touch and sending us newsletters and the loop and all of that, that we've gone back just about every year. It's been a little bit wonky because of the pandemic, of course, but for most years, we've gone back and participated in the 5K, even though we don't really have a direct connection, but we just feel like we're we're kind of part of their family there at this point. And so we go back and, and we donate a couple of times a year outside of that. So I love to tell that story because I think it gives hope to people who run peer-to-peer -peer events, which have tended, in my opinion, to, to kind of gotten a bad rap that 
highly retainable, those donors. And, and, and the data, unfortunately, kind of supports that. I think it's less than 10% of peer-to-peer donations are, are retained. But I'm here to say from my personal experience that if you have someone who can follow up and get to know you, do all things that we've been talking about with telling stories and, and getting that communication cadence down and all of that, you absolutely can retain those donors. So I, I can tell you that when we don't go to, to peer-to-peer events or Facebook fundraising pages or whatever they are, we do at the cause that our friend is advocating for. And, and we have said before, I don't, I don't really care about that that much, so we'll probably put it out. But then when our things that are important, they're telling a good story, they're letting what's, what's going on and what we're supporting, we're much more likely to support that. So if, for those of you who are using peer events as a way to pull those donors in, don't think that you're, that, that you should relegate that the scrap heap once they're not ever going to come back and you got to go out and get a whole fresh batch the next year. You can, you, you can retain those donors if you put the time and effort into it. So that's always one of my, one of my favorite stories. And then we've got another group, I'm just thinking locally here for some reason, and uh, in, in Richmond, it's a women's shelter. They started using, they were on an older antiquated system, started using Bloomerang. And uh, I was at the conference, the Virginia Fundraising Institute conference uh, over the summer. And Mary came up and gave me this big hug. And she's two years was, and I'm so happy we chose Bloomerang. Thank you so much for helping us. Our fundraising has gone up 30% since we started Bloomerang because you all provide us with the tools that we need so that we know how to segment, we know who to talk to, when to talk to them, all of that stuff we didn't have before. You all gave us the tools and, and we're doing really, really well now. I, I certainly am an advocate for technology and, and how it like easier and how to use it to better fundraise and to communicate with the right person at the right time and all. And so it's always gratifying when I see someone who says, yeah, that's, that's what happened to us. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. And you make the point very well that there is, there's a lot to be said for a quality system and technology, and it must be mirrored or working hand in hand with the human touch. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And for any of our listeners who are, are one-person shops, or even if you're a larger shop and you just don't feel like you have the capacity to pick up that phone and talk with your supporters, don't underestimate the incredible power of having board members, leadership volunteers, even some of your program lead. Pick up the phone and thank people and ask them what inspired you to give. What is it about our work? The board member idea is such a good idea. They will fall all over themselves being so happy that you ask. No, I'm totally kidding. You'll have to (laughs) them keep being and screaming. But once they do it, I've heard so many stories in all seriousness about board members who are are apathetic at best about phone calls and dreading them at worst. And then they would get on the phone, make two phone calls, talk to someone for five minutes doesn't have to be a long long conversation five ten minute phone call and then say that was great i got a chance to see the organization that i care about so deeply from someone's from a new person's eyes right i got a chance to see what they see and to feel their excitement and how i feel rejuvenated and re-energized so i you nailed it tammy i couldn't couldn't recommend highly enough getting your board members involved if you can that's a great idea yeah, you're right. They get that passion retread themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. Don't think that you have to have every board member doing it. Right. Some will, some won't. But when that board reconvenes, I love to acknowledge the heck out of the board members who did. Yes. And give them a chance to share their experience. And that might just inspire a couple more board members to say, I could do that too. Yep. Yep. And tell them voicemails count. They're totally fine. They, most of us don't listen to our voicemails anymore. We have the text or whatever on our phone, and we, but we read it. We, oh, that was really nice. It's happened at least twice this year where someone has called me. I haven't read it ever, so I didn't answer. Went to voicemail. Oh, that was the ED here in town. That was really nice of her. You still get the warm feeling, so totally counts. And, and yeah, it, it can be a great experience for your board members. Very cool. 
James, you've been so wonderful and so helpful. Thank you for joining us. Oh, it's been my pleasure. This has been delightful. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So at the end of each episode, I like to ask a few rapid fire questions to provide just a little extra value to our listeners. All right, here we go. James, what's the best fundraising advice you've ever heard or received? Oh, man. So I think I'm going to cheat a little bit and go back to the phone calls thing. I think that they provide a value at such a cost of investment for the organization. Literally, the gift side is doubles. It's twice as fast and you retain them twice as often as, as if you don't make a phone call. So pick up the phone, man. Just pick it up and make those calls. Just do it. So what book do you recommend to our audience and why? So we've talked a lot about automation today. And as I said, I'm a big, big fan of automation, particularly when it comes to your technology, the, the CRMs. However, you have to balance that with the human touch and make sure that you're losing that, that human touch. So a good friend of mine, I'm sure Stephen had put a book a couple of years ago called Robots Make Bad Fundraisers. And I can't more highly recommend it. He's got great stories in there. It's a funny read, but it also makes some really good points about, yes, we need to automate things and we need to have a cadence for when somebody gives, but we want to make really sure that we have the, the human touch involved in that. And then just for fun, not a, not a work-related book, book. My, my favorite book that I've read recently is called The Nightingale by Kristen Hanna. And I, I won't spoil anything about it, but if anyone wants a good read over the holiday, go check that out. I will warn you that I read it while I was on the treadmill and there was some ugly cries going on a couple of times there. So it's, it's, it's a tough one, but it is a just fantastic book all the way through. So if you get a chance, check that one. Thank you for those recommendations. And I will say, that in earlier podcast episode this year, we did interview Stephen Shattuck about his book, Robots Make Bad Fundraisers. So we go back and listen to that episode. Pick up the book. Yep. Stephen's great. I'm sure yeah. that was a great episode. And The Nightingale. I'm going to have to pick that up. It's fantastic. James, what are the three most important traits a successful fundraising professional must possess? Yeah. So I think empathy is at the a list for me for not only the people that they serve, of course, but for their donors as well. I think being able to put your donor shoes and have that gun decisions and the communication and all of that moving forward. I think tenacity is, is another one. I think that unfortunately, in both sales and in fundraising, we hear no more often than we want to. So the ability, I, I'm calling it tenacity, but the ability to water off a duck's back or whatever you want to call it, moving on to the next thing is, is critical. And then I think creativity. I think the ability for fundraisers to think about new events and new ways of reaching out to people and all the wonderful things that you all do on a day-to-day -day basis to inform your donors, delight your donors, and engage your donors is absolutely critical. This next question, you might have a little bit of bias, but the question is, what's your favorite fundraising tool or application? Well, I was going to say something sarcastic, but I don't want to be fired. So I'm going to say Bloomerang. Uh, and I've been uh, been with Bloomerang almost since the beginning and I love it. I will will just say that I think that the software itself does what you need it to do. And it does it really, really well. But what really set at the risk of being sappy, what really sets Bloomerang apart is the people I work with. I am, I am honored and lucky and blessed to work with the best group of people that I've ever worked with by far. The people that I work with are genuinely passionate about how you all do your jobs more easily, because if you're able to segment those lists more easily, if you're able to send those email newsletters out more easily, able to run those board reports more easily, whatever it is, then hopefully that frees you up to go raise more money and that'll further your mission and impact your communities. And I can honestly say that's why most of us get out of bed in the morning is that we want to help you help your community. And, and I can echo th that sentiment. I mean, our experience with Bloomerang staff members, employees has really been incredible hearing, knowledgeable. I feel that authenticity in that, and I share your experience. Good. Uh, now this, I know you speak at conferences quite often, so this one might get you into a little bit of trouble. The question is, what's your favorite conference or ongoing learning experience? 
I have, I have yet to genuinely sound like I'm being political, but I'm really not. I haven't been to a conference. I haven't been to one where I thought oh, that was a waste of time. I, I guess I am going to be a little political when I say that I would urge people to look for local opportunities through your local community foundation, maybe. I know here in Charlottesville, where I live, we have the Center for Nonprofit Excellence that is amazing. They hold monthly webinars and trainings and all kinds of really good stuff there. So don't forget our, your local AFP chapters. All of these local resources are do a really nice job. So do not forget about those. Regionally, I mentioned the Virginia Fundraising Institute. I is... I'm biased because it's only an hour from where I live, but they, the, the quality of the speakers they get every year just stuns me. It's really, really good. So if you have a statewide conference, I would definitely urge you to check that out as well. And then for a national one, it's hard storytellers. It was such a great conference this year. I had such a nice time. Really, I thought the presentation went, went really well, but a good time just talking with people afterwards and before about all kinds of good fundraising questions and tips and all of that good stuff. Yeah, I, I would say those those are those are my favorites. Awesome. Last question: Knowing what you know about fundraising now, what advice would you give your younger self or anyone just getting started in the profession? Learn to use a database, CRM, whatever you want to call it, something more than just Excel. You need something to help you manage. I, I think when I've gotten trouble into trouble in my career, it's because I've thought, I don't need to put, I'll remember it. I, we were just talking. We had a conversation. He said he loves going to traveling to Puerto Rico. And Emily and I just went to Puerto Rico. So I'll remember it. I don't. I never remember it. So put the in, consider your database to be the most important tool that you have, because it's how you are going to, as we were talking about earlier, it's how you're going to take those small donors, turn them into mid-level donors, and then eventually turn some of those into donors. You're not going to be able to remember everything that's living in your head and it, all the conversations that you have and all of that. So put it all down faithfully into your, into whatever database you choose. That'll help you organize your career to help you organize your fundraising life. And it'll make your job so much easier as you, as you start getting into things. Yeah, I love that. And I think it honors the donor, especially given the yeah. turnover that we experience in our sector. It's a disservice for the donor to be sharing why they give over and over and over again. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah, so exactly. good. Thank you for joining us, James. No, thank you for having me. This has been great. Awesome. If you want to learn more about James or Bloomerang, we've included links in today's show notes. You'll also find a link to download Bloomerang's 13-year-end fundraising tips and the Beginner's Guide to Nonprofit Data Segmentation, as well as links to the other resources we've talked about today. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Intentional Fundraiser Podcast. Keep on transforming your fundraising so you can transform the world. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you to our friends at Bloomerang for supporting this episode. Learn why fundraisers love using Bloomerang and grab your copy of the 13 year-end fundraising tips ebook at bloomerang.com forward slash intentional dash fundraiser. The link is in the show notes. That's it for this episode of the Intentional Fundraiser Podcast. If you like this podcast, subscribe and download each episode on your favorite podcast platform. Share it on social media with the hashtag, The Intentional Fundraiser, and tag me, Tammy Zonker, and you'll be entered into a drawing for some great swag, books, and courses. And if you like today's show, you might also be interested in becoming a member of my Fundraising Transformer community where I go live twice a month with my members with fundraising training and group coaching to help transform those fundraising issues that keep you awake at night where I pull back the curtain on how you can take your fundraising results to the next level by teaching ways you can improve your development operations create a results driven donor centric development plan strengthen donor relationships improve your donor retention rates and build a raging monthly giving program 
income and a successful major gifts program and how you can approach each day to ensure you'll perform at your highest level so you can be the best fundraiser and the best person you can possibly be. You can learn more about becoming a member at fundraisingtransform.com forward slash transformers. Thank you for showing up and for having the courage and determination to transform your fundraising so you can transform the world. Bye for now.